So in addition to the overall expansion of space, we seem to have some things that are moving towards us. These are called peculiar motions, peculiar because they don't fit in with the Hubble law. Where are these things coming from? Well, there's a, a sort of balance of two things going on. If you have two galaxies floating in space, the space between them is going to be expanding and pulling them apart, but their gravity is going to be pulling them together. And I've put together a simulation showing this with spheres instead of galaxies, and you can see these things are all being carried apart, but gravity is also pulling them together. Slowly. So expansion of space is carrying things apart. Things are a long way apart, it carried apart quite fast. But likewise, gravity is coming in here and pulling things together. So you can see just up here, things are sticking together. I kind of like how they burp, you know, they belch when galaxies, uh, one of them eats the other one. Well done. But at the same time, so the universe is getting expanding, and the individual things that are close to each other are getting closer. So you're getting a universe that's beginning to have voids in it and lumps and bumps of clusters. And you often get swarms of galaxies all orbiting around each other at high speed, like the one down there, then a big empty region, then another group or cluster of galaxies. So if I were right in the middle looking out, I would see a Hubble law, but then I'd see all these perturbations to it, where things, some will be coming towards me, some are going away from me, depending on the gravitational field around. Yes. So on large scales, so if you and I are very far away, the gravity between us is going to be very weak, so we're not going to have much motion due to our mutual gravity, but there's a lot of space between us to carry us apart. So right. the expansion of space is going to win. If we're very close together, yep. then the gravity is very strong and there's not much space to expand between us, so in that case, gravity will probably so we'll go, win. Rah, boom. Yes. And if we're somewhere in the middle, it's going to be a bit confusing. It is. Okay, so how does this work in the real universe? Okay, so here's a map of the local part of the universe with us in the middle in the local group. So we've got the local group, which is us, Andromeda, and a whole bunch of small galaxies like the Magellanic Clouds. Yep. And on this scale, gravity totally wins. It's yep. much more important. So and we're so all bound together, sort of like a swarm of bees. Yep. And the same thing applies to any galaxy cluster, like, for example, the Virgo cluster over here. Internally within it, the gravity is much stronger than the expansion, so the things are just going to swarm around. So the Virgo cluster, from memory, is about... 16 megaparsecs, or 50 million light years in distance. And when we observe the galaxies there, they're moving at a rate on average of about 1100 kilometers per second. So that's how much space is expanded, but that's so massive we know that gravity is pretty strong and it seems that we're falling in at about 300 kilometers per second, which means if there was no gravity at all, it would appear to really be about 1,400 kilometers per second. So there's that peculiar motion that we can sort of see in that case. It's yeah. quite hard to measure, though. Yeah, so on scales of about you know, one or two or three megaparsecs, gravity wins, and things are sucked to each other by more than the expansion of space. By the time you're out at uh, 10, 20 megaparsecs, like a Virgo cluster, the expansion of space wins. It is moving away from us, but it doesn't win convincingly. It's a narrow margin of victory. Yep. So of order 300 kilometers per second motion superimposed on the overall expansion. Um, when you get out further and further and further, you're still getting these random 300 kilometers per second type motions, but they're now superimposed on a much bigger value. So if you're going away at 30,000 kilometers a second, yep. 300 kilometers a second isn't much of an error. Yeah, it's a 1% problem. And, you know, most of the time in cosmology, we don't worry too much about 1%, although we're getting pretty good at it now where we do have to worry about okay, it. Okay, so small scales, peculiar motions dominate, big scales, not really, the expansion of space dominates. So, so let's think about how we can take all the information in the sky and put it together and try to measure the force of gravity. Yes, let's use these peculiar motions to tell us how strong gravity is. This was done uh, by the 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey here in Australia. And what they did was they did a survey of an absolutely huge number of galaxies. And they'd take strips on the sky, and for each galaxy they'd measure where it was in the strip, and they'd measure its redshift. Now, if there were no peculiar motions, redshift would tell you distance. Uh, but because there are peculiar motions, there's some other, due to mass, there's some funny effects going on. And what they've got to plot here is, for each galaxy, they've plotted the relative position of every other galaxy. <coughs> and so they might take galaxy number one and look to plot where every other galaxy is. They've plotted the relative redshift up here yep. and the relative position across the sky along here. <coughs> so what you're going to go through is you're going to measure how far apart they are in velocity, put that plot, how far apart they are on the sky as the other one, and you do that for every pair of galaxies. And then when you've got a lot of galaxies, you'll make it that color. When you have very few, you'll make it that color. 
Now, if galaxies were just distributed randomly, there'd be no more chance of seeing galaxies close to each other than far away. So this diagram would just look an absolutely uniform shade of that color. That is that the average difference in redshift and the average distance in uh, separation on the sky would be the same. And galaxies wouldn't be closer. But in fact, yeah. galaxies tend to be gregarious, like people. If you want to know where to find a person, the most likely place is close to another person. Likewise, if you like to find another galaxy, the most likely place is close to another galaxy. And, and that tells you this is going to be high in the middle yeah. and low further out. But it also tells you that if you're moving, if I'm being attracted to you, I'm going to have a peculiar motion. So I'm going to have a velocity which is different. I'm going to be falling towards you, mm -hmm. which means my velocity is going to be closer to yours. I'm falling towards you either behind or in front than if I'm not related to you at all. Yeah, so if, <coughs> if there were no peculiar motions, then the redshift, the velocity, would indicate purely distance. Yep. And you'd expect this whole diagram to look like a perfect circle, because the odds of two things being separated along the line of sight, as opposed to perpendicular to the line of sight, should be the same. Yep. Once again, we're assuming we're not in a special place in the universe. So this curve should be symmetrical, like a perfect circle, and the odds of finding one galaxy close to another galaxy should be the same in any direction. But what you actually see are two funny things. One thing you see is a sort of stripe along here. Yep. These are called fingers of God. And you see them in all these redshift diagrams. It looks like there are fingers of galaxies pointing at the Earth. Yeah, and so that's what you see when you actually look at a cluster like we showed you. The, the galaxies come in and they sort of do a mix master. And you can sort of see it in your simulation. And they swarm around each other as a swarm of bees. And that's right next to each other. So it's right in the center of the clusters you see that. So, so that's very small separations. You see very large velocities. Yes, so the velocity differences are very large, not because they're at different distances, but simply because they're moving back and forwards in a massive cluster. Yep. So that gives us the finger of God. So God is not actually pointing at us in these diagrams. It's just due to the swarming of bees' motion. Yep. But then on the outskirts, it looks a bit pancaked. It's actually squashed the other yeah, way. Squashed. And, and that's, that's because things are actually falling in towards each other. Yep, so things here are falling in towards the center. Things here are falling into the center. And so you see a squishiness. And so that squishiness, the more squishy it is, the more stuff there is in the universe, on average. And so this was used to actually estimate how much mass there is uh, on really large scales, including all yep. the dark matter. And it turns out it comes up to about 30% of the critical density. You're still not at that critical density. So you're 30%. So, again, looks like we're done. Game over. Well, is that really the case? I mean, could there perhaps be... Let's imagine there was some form of dark matter that had a really high temperature, so the particles moved around fast. That means they wouldn't coalesce to form clusters or superclusters of galaxies. That would mean they'd spread pretty uniformly everywhere. Yep. And if that was the case, we wouldn't be able to tell them, would we? Because they would be equal amounts of dark matter on the left and on the right and above and below, so you wouldn't move. It wouldn't cause any emotion. So could we even see something that uniform? So you wouldn't be able to see it, but it would cause another problem, Paul. It would mean we could never have formed to begin with. It would have not allowed our gravity to have formed the galaxy to begin with because that, was, that force of gravity would have pulled us apart and not allowed the formation of the Milky Way. So we couldn't, so we'd be blind to it here, but the fact that we exist at all tells us that that's not there. So I think we can safely cross that out. Okay, so we seem to have got our answer to this, that the universe is open, that there's not enough mass to do it. But as we'll see, it's not quite the whole story.